Thank you. Right. I'm just going to get my notes ready. Hello. Hello. For those of you who haven't caught on, I'm Matt. <laughs> I'm usually out with the kids, but I'm here this morning to talk to you. And I've got quite a bit to say, so I'm going to go straight into it. I might go a little bit fast. But hey, Holy Spirit might take over and I might just stop. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> you never know. I want to start by setting two kind of key verses that I want you to keep in the back of your minds when we look at the main scripture, which is going to be Revelation 2. So you can flick there now, but I'm going to talk about something different. So first, I want to highlight Revelation 19.7, because that, for me, for the church, for all of us, that's telling us where it's all headed. So where to start with this? I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent. <laughs> There's something that happens when conflict happens in the world, when two large countries fight or two powerful people disagree. There's this fear that rides in and everybody starts thinking, oh, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? You get rumours of World War Three, right? And everyone's, oh, this is going to happen. Atomic war this, atomic war that. And it really frustrates me. And I'm starting there now because Revelation 19.7 tells us actually where the end of the world's going to be. It tells us what happens at the end of times. So we don't need to buy into that fear. So that's where we're starting. And Revelation 19 shows us, it says, the day of the wedding of the Lamb has come. Yay. The wedding of the Lamb has come. That's where it's all headed, right? So it's not heading to a giant war where one country is going to blow up the other and then, you know, we're all just going to scream and die. That's not where it's going to end. It's going to end in a wedding feast. So we can stand secure in that and we can read the room, we can read the world, we can read the news, we can do everything through that lens. And I might call that the bridal paradigm later on, so that's what I'm referring to. It's like this lens that we know it's all based in love, we know it's all headed to a wedding, you know? Everything that God is about is towards love, it's out of love. He's not interested in control, he's not interested in our religion or how well our church service goes, what bits we do and what bits we don't do. He's interested in leading us as a good, good shepherd into encounters with his son that produce love. And if they produce love, we're going to be ready for the wedding day. That's what I want to talk about, because the next bit of this verse, verse 8, says something along the lines of, the bride has prepared herself for that wedding day. So there's an expectation on us as the bride, as the church, to do something in preparation. Yeah? Awesome. So the church is going to... This is the second verse. So Matt twenty two thirty seven. you hear that Jesus tells us what the most important commandment is, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. So that's the other one I need you to keep in the back of your mind. Because the church's job is to lose herself so fully in her love for Jesus, in following that first commandment. That's her first job, right? So we're sitting here, what's our first job? It's to love the Lord our God with all our hearts, our minds, and our souls. Nothing else matters. So if we lose ourselves enough in that, that everything else is going to fall away. It's going to lead nice and smoothly into that marriage day. It's going to lead gently to union, right? So keep those in the back of your mind. Everything is framed in love. You see this, this is the kind of encounter language when you look at the story of Mary and Martha. Presence has to be our priority. There is one thing that's primary, and that's his presence. If we don't have that, we have nothing. Absolutely nothing. If we don't have the presence of Jesus here, then we have nothing. We've got to remain in his presence. Everything else, when we do that, will become inconsequential. It'll become symptomatic. It'll become nothing because we're in the present. That's what's important. So I want to notice one more thing about this. No, I noticed it already. Hey, check me out. I'm ahead of my notes, guys. <laughs> Gosh, I'm good. Um, no, so my point is... <laughs> my head's getting big now. No, my point is that this is the hour for preparation. It also goes on to say what the bride will wear. Jesus gives us the pure white linen clothes that we're going to wear at the wedding day. And there's Jewish culture context in that, that the bridegroom provides the gowns for everybody to wear. But it's also just something that God does... And I've noticed this, we, me and Trinity, when we were in Wales, 
we would study the Bible at night together and we're doing this whole purity thing as well. So it was quite a funny scene. Trinity's on the bed and she's got her Bible open and I'm on the floor to stay away from her. And I've got my Bible open <laughs> and we're reading and we kind of compare notes and do that whole thing. And if you look, so right now, just context, Revelation is the last book if you don't know that. And Jesus is going to clothe the bride with the pure white linen clothes. So now we're going to go to the beginning of the book and notice that in Genesis, he also does some clothing. There's this moment right after the fall, right after Adam and Eve have done what they did and caused everything. So it's the very beginning of human history, the fall, that whole shebang. And what God does, we don't focus on the cursing bit, but if you focus on the detail, what he does is he clothes them. He cuts them animal skins to cover them up. And he's not doing that for his sake. He knew they were naked because he made them. But now that they're aware that they're naked, he's moved with love and compassion because he's such a good shepherd that he's going to clothe them. So we see this kind of bookend moment where he clothes us at the beginning and he's going to clothe us again at the end. But then I want to focus on that preparation moment for the rest of, of, of this morning. Awesome. So Revelation 2 verse 12, that's what we're going to talk about. Jesus, he sends seven letters to the seven angels of the seven churches. And this is one in particular we're going to focus on. I'm a literature student, so I quickly want to give some, some literary bits just to help us study. So sometimes when you notice patterns in the word, it helps you understand different things. So in each of these seven letters, you get repeated patterns and phrases, and you also get a repeated structure. So Jesus gives you a location of the church, then he gives you an identification, and those two are super linked, because I think in six of seven of them, the name place actually means the, the identity as well. And we'll get into that in a second. Then you get the revelation of him. He presents himself in a different way to each of the churches. And then you get situation. He says, hey, I know where you are. I know what's going on. Let me help. And he offers an exhortation and a motivation. So does that kind of flow through all of them? And we're going to touch on all of those in this particular one. So we're looking at the church in Pergamum. So verse 12 starts, to the angel of the church in Pergamum, right. And I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> and I want to look at the word Pergamum. So Pergamum is our location, but it's also our identity because Pergamum means marriage. So now my previous verses are making a bit more sense. Jesus in this letter is a jealous lover, right? He's not stood there thinking, okay, you're doing things wrong, church, I'm going to tell you off. He's saying, no, I love you so much. And for the sake of our connection, I'm highlighting this thing. And that's what I feel he's doing, even in this time, that, that this was written to a church a long time ago, right? We know that. It's basic. But the Spirit is highlighting this message right now for us in this time so we can prepare to be the bride. And he's also highlighting this side of his face, which I'll touch on in a second. So you've got identification, location, Pergamum, marriage. Everything else from this message is framed in that, that space of marriage, that space of love, that bridal paradigm. Hold on to that. Okay, so, right, these words, these are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. We'll stop there, that's just the end of 12. So right there, we get the revelation of him, how he presents himself to this church. Him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. It doesn't sound like something you'd take to a wedding. <laughs> right, you'd get thrown out for that. But... Just straight up off the bat, Jesus is not politically correct, so he would take a sword to a wedding. Okay, so what is this telling us? Jesus is the Word of God. He is the Word of God in flesh. And the Word of God is the Son of God in print. They are the same person. So the sharp double-edged sword we see in Hebrews that it is him. He is that kind of sharp, under wrong word. He is that sharp and determined voice that speaks into our life. He doesn't sit on a fence. Like I said, he's not politically correct. He has opinions about things because he is the truth. Right? So the sharp double-edged sword means the word of God. It means the truth. I'm here to bring you truth. That's what he's saying. And it also points to that second coming. So it points us back to how we can prepare. Because when Jesus comes, it will not be because of a World War III, but it will be when he rips the sky open and there is a sword coming out of his mouth. So it points us to that as well. So you have to keep these things in mind as you understand the rest of the message. 
Beautiful. Verse 13. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. That's heavy. Took a, took a turn, right? Jesus is like, okay, you live with Satan. So let, let's look at that. This is the situation that I was talking about. So we're on like our fourth point. It's a situation. I know where you live. And what I want to do here is I want to look at what that meant for Pergamum. So then, and then I also want to look at what it means for us now. So then, Pergamum was one of the first cities to fall to the rule of Rome. Rome worshipped their emperors. So instantly you've got idolatry. Everybody in that place would be made to worship the emperor of Rome, not God. Yeah? And we all know that idolatry is a bad thing. Yeah? I'm seeing nods. That's a good thing. Good start. <laughs> so you've got idolatry straight away. And then also in Pergamum, they have in the center of their city. So imagine instead of the bull ring, we've got a hundred foot statue of Zeus. And you go there in this time and you would worship him. You would make sacrifices to him. And they would perform sexual acts as part of that. So they would go to this statue. Oh, I moved the mic too far then. <laughs> They would go to the statue and they would perform sexual acts as part of their worship to him. So we see that Pergamum is a place of deep, 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 deep mess. Okay, you've got huge idolatry. You've got sexual immorality literally in the streets and kind of told, they told the world that that was worship. Okay, so it's, it's messy. It's a messy, messy place. And yet, let's remember the first words in verse 13, I know where you live. Jesus knows about the mess. He sees the mess and yet he locks eyes with it. He says, I know where you live. I see the mess that is happening around you. I see the mess and I am not afraid to lock eyes with it. I'm not afraid to lock eyes with the mess. And he does this out of his love because he's so in love with those people that he wants their attention. Yeah? Right, now let's look at this bit of notes. Sorry, my paper's a mess. It's all folded. And how have I even fixed this? I'll just, I'll just rip it off. Okay. So, yeah, as for the sake of our relationship and for that, that the next step, you know, you take that next step into intimacy with Jesus. That's why he's, he stood there as the truth and he's locked eyes with the mess. He's saying, I want your affections. He stood as that jealous bridegroom. He's saying, hey, you. I want your affections. That's what I'm here for. I'm here for your time, your energy, your money, your love. I am here for it, and it is mine. So hand it over. Right? He's coming as the bridegroom, and he's yelling about it. He's not, he's not doing like a sheepish, hey, I'd really, I'd really like to get to know you. It's, it's a bold thing. I mean, he's holding a double-edged sword. He's like, I want your affections. Yeah? My notes have gone flying. So now, like I said earlier, is not the time to sit on a politically correct fence. There is no safety in that. You will fall off on one side or the other. Okay? But now is the time to submit to Jesus' presence and allow him to use that sword on you, which is painful. I felt it. <laughs> right? So it is not the time. But what is the time? I want to talk about now. What does Pergamum look like now? So, I mean, it looks like everything, right? Pergamum sounds like the world we live in. And so much more for the younger generation. So you've got the millennials, the Gen Z, the alphas, right? Everybody down and above me. I'm kind of in the middle of that. But, so let me open this up. Idolatry is huge. Idolatry of self. Idolatry of spouse. Idolatry of celebrities, of media, of sports, of cars of fashion, of absolutely anything, even idolatry of pastors, right? I heard a preach recently where the pastor stood there and she said, I'm going to fail you at some point. I am human just like you, so do not cling to me, cling to him. Okay, so you, even in a church setting, you cannot idolize anybody who's at the front because we're a mess just like you. I'm just being real. We're just as much of a mess. And then you look around the world and you see sexual immorality. It's literally 
everywhere. And again, it's more relevant for those younger generations. But we have a role to play in that. It doesn't matter where you fit on that age range because the enemy is coming after the young people. And it's our job to recognise that and to stand in the gap and to take a part in being the solution. It doesn't matter if we're not targeted by that specific arrow of the enemy. We can still be the shield to stop it. So what does this look like in our space? We've got confused gender identity. We've got confused sexuality, adulterous relationships, porn industry, trafficking. And then you look at all that and you think, wow, that's a mess. And then you look at the education system and realise it's filtering into that space as well. So this is not an issue that we can stay on the fence about anymore. It's not a conversation that we can avoid having because we're church and we just do lovey-dovey stuff. Jesus, the one we follow, has a double-edged sword. It's sharp. <laughs> it's sharp. So we have to talk about these things. We have to talk about these things. But there is hope. It's not just a doom and gloom message. Jesus sees it. And I need you to know I'm preaching to myself just as much <laughs> as I am to you guys. But Jesus sees the mess and he sees the state of the world. But he also, in the, the following verses of following words of, of verse 13, he sees the church being faithful. He mentions the martyr Antipas and he says, you guys aren't doing too bad. So there is hope, right? So we could take some comfort in that. <laughs> and then verse 14 comes in with a huge but. A huge but. I'm just... It happened, as I said it. A huge but. <laughs> My translation says, nevertheless. I should have gone with that. <laughs> it says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so they would food. So they ate food sacrifices to the idols and committed sexual immorality. Awesome. So what does this mean? Like I said, nevertheless or but, it's a huge turning point. Literature student, I see words like that. It's like, okay, something's going to change. And there's always a comma after it too if you can't identify that. If there's a comma after the first word, it's changing something. But that, that's, that one's free. You can have that. Um, <laughs> So this is, our more, this is more of our situation. Jesus is deepening it. He's getting into the specifics. And he's, he's opening up this idea of Balaam and Balak, which we're going to quickly talk about. So what does Balaam mean? That's where I want to start. It means the swallower of people. It is taking over the people of God, the people of the world. And even just at that point, if I said to you, what's the swallower of people in this generation? I know that my mind, at least, would go to these issues of idolatry and sexual immorality. It is a swallower of people because it is so pleasurable to our humanity to engage in those things. Okay. Balaam and Balak. They're from the Old Testament, specifically Numbers 22. If you want to read that, do it in your own time. I don't, I don't think we've got time for that. So towards the end of their kind of 40 years of wandering, the Israelites turn up in a place and Balak is the king there and he's terrified because these guys have killed other kings and he's worrying. He's like, oh no, what's going to happen? The Israelites are going to finish me off. So he calls up his good friend Balaam. He says, hey, Balaam, I need you to come and curse these people, the Israelites. I need you to curse them, stop them in their tracks, finish them off. I can't be, can't be overthrown. That's the vibe. But Balak, Balaam, sorry, he tries he comes and he tries because he wants the money, but he cannot do it because he's a prophet of God and everything that comes out of his mouth turns into a blessing. And there's chapters of this. He gives different curses, but they're actually just blessings because every time he opens his mouth, God just blesses his people, which is powerful in itself. You could have a message on that. Um, right, so he, what he does instead is he offers a teaching to Balak, and that is often... What happens when, you, when you, people can't manage to curse you and the enemy can't curse you, he'll deceive you. He comes to kill, destroy, deceive. Deceive. He's going to deceive and distort and change things. So he offers a teaching that deceives the Israelites and tells them, you are so blessed that you can do whatever you want and God won't touch you. So modern language is an abuse of grace. Is God has so much grace that you can go and do whatever you want. You can go and be with the, the statue of Zeus every Wednesday and it won't matter because you're just too blessed. And nobody's, nobody's that blessed. Nobody's that blessed. Okay, 
So in the same way that, wait, I've skipped a bit. Let me go back. Balaam. Balaam is on this journey. He's on a donkey and he stopped in his tracks. The donkey's really naughty. It's misbehaving a lot, but there's a reason. There is an angel stood ahead of him in the road. And what's the angel holding? A double-edged sword. And he's confronting this deception. So in the same way that Balaam is confronted, Jesus is jealously confronting the hearts of us today and the people in Pergamum saying, don't be split in your affections. He's saying, be fully spent on me. Be fully spent on me. Okay. Verse 15 says, likewise, you also have those who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. A similar, similar thing there. I'm not going to open that up too much. Verse 16, we get an exhortation. Jesus tells us what to do. He says, repent therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. You don't want that. The sword is a painful process. You know, it's like the Lion of Judah. I don't know if any of you have seen that scene in Narnia when Eustace is a dragon, but Aslan uses his claws to scrape away those scales. That was not an easy, comfortable process. But for deception to go, you have to face the sword. And we've had that in our life. I, I might open that up at the end. So you get this exhortation. The Lord is saying that a lot, he's saying it a lot today. I read my notes awfully then. He's saying, stick to the truth, stick to me. Stay within the sword, let it refine you, let it sharpen you and let go of the things of the world. You know, there's so many things in our life like entertainment, media, I mentioned them all earlier. We spend a lot of time on that. I spend a lot of time on those things. Instagram is addictive. Netflix is easy. You just click a button and you're there for six hours and it, the time's gone. Your heart is split in affections because you'd rather do that sometimes, if we're honest, than sit and study the word. But what the Lord is saying is you cannot be split in your affections. He's just so in love with you. He's so absolutely obsessed in the healthiest way that he says, I love you too much to leave you where you are. I love you way too much to let you carry on doing that. Let me help you. Let me help you with that. Let us, let us get rid of it. Okay. So that's, that's kind of what I want to say today. I pray that a seed is being planted in our hearts that will begin to allow you to become dissatisfied with the things that you love. And that seems like a cruel prayer. I hope that you are no longer satisfied with the things that you love that are not in God. I pray that you would only be satisfied with 100% Jesus. Let him cut up your ways. Because Balaam, I don't think I, Balak, I don't think I open that up a little bit more. But it literally just means that you're going the opposite way to God. I think it's Numbers twenty two eighteen. He says, your way is contrary to mine. It literally is just going your own way. So God is facing this way and you're facing this way. Oh, it's me. <laughs> right? So you're facing the other way. And what does repent mean? It means to literally turn around and go the other way. Go in the, the other direction. So that's the exhortation. It's to turn away from the things of your own way and go in the way of the Lord. And out of that comes purity. I know that's a bit of a buzzword, so don't panic. The purity comes out of that absolute adoration of Jesus. When you are so consumed with love for him, everything else, it just doesn't matter. You don't want it anymore. Because once you've been satisfied by the living water, nothing else will satisfy you. So purity happens as a byproduct. Right, let's, let's finish these verses. 17, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. So this is the motivation. So what's the point of all this? Why would I want to do this? Why are you calling me into this, Lord? I will give you some of the hidden manna. Manna 
is representative in this moment of the intimacy of the secret place. That's where you find that hidden manna. And manna sustains, and you can only live off of the manna of today. If you look at the Old Testament, you live off the manna of today, not yesterday. So that means you have to have continuous secret place encounters with Jesus. You continuously come back to the double-edged sword and allow him to cut down what you want, to cut down your ways, and to point you back to the way of him. Keep you on the straight and narrow you could say. You know, you have to continuously have those love encounters where, I don't know if you've ever had this, I get this a lot, where you're about to do something and then your heart cries out. And it's not your heart, it's actually the spirit within you. Say, no, no, don't do this. This time, this attention, this part of your heart, it's for Jesus. And we ignore that a lot. And that's what the next bit's talking about. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it. In Old Testament times, the jury would push forward a black stone for the guilty and a white stone for the innocent. And in this, this whole topic of idolatry and split attentions and not giving 100% to Jesus, I wonder if we take, took just a moment to be really brutally honest with ourselves, what coloured stone would you expect the jury to push forward for your life. Mine wouldn't be white. Not every week. Some weeks it could be, but not every week it would not be white. And on that is a new name, a new identity. I want to go back to marriage days now. The bride, which is us, receives a new name on her wedding day. She takes her husband's name. That's what Jesus promises us. He promises us freedom and forgiveness and a clean slate and a fresh name and a new family. You go back to Genesis. He's had this plan since even before creation. The Godhead decided, yes, that person's worth saving. Yes, I will take up human form. I will die. I will take every single bit of sin that the world has to throw at me because I love that person and I want to give them the chance, not even the guarantee, just the chance to be in relationship with me. He did that. But like I said, the sword is painful. It's a really painful journey. And it's often linked to this purity thing when we talk about it. So I want to share a bit of my story. Me and Trinity, we lived together when we were in Wales. We went to study for three years. And we had this whole idea. We were like, okay, Jesus is our number one now. We're going to be pure. We're going to sleep, like I said, in separate beds. Trim was up on the bed. I was a gentleman, so I took the floor. It was a mistake. I have a bad back now. But it was worth it. And, and we did those sorts of things. We'd study and stay separate and keep distance. And all those, you know, it all makes sense in theory, right? You think it's going to work. And then in practice, it doesn't quite play out. So we, we didn't quite make it on that purity plan. We slipped up and we own that. But then there was this process that we had to go through because I was just coming onto team with these guys. I was just about to start leading all these young people. So we went through a very long process of, first of all, processing it of, okay, my life is over or is it not over? Where are we at with that? Because <laughs> it's like, I'm just about to be employed with the church and I've just done one of the big taboo sins. This is messy. It's messy, but Jesus looks at the mess. He locks eyes with the mess. And we had this process. So first we own it. And that looked like a lot of nights of kneeling in front of the Bible and just weeping. Just weeping at it. And we we spent a lot of time as well looking at, at that Genesis verse of he clothes us. He clothes us. It's his righteousness that we live from, not our own. That's literally the point. It's the whole point. It's he's going to clothe us in the pure white linens, not ourselves. But we have to be willing to do the process. And we went through a bunch of practical stuff too. So we spoke to every single parent in our group and explained what was going on, where we were going with it, how we were owning it. We explained to the whole church via communication. And it wasn't out of shame what it was out of. It was out of this place of I'm not going to hide this because if I hide it, it's going to have power over me and I need to be able to give everything to Jesus. But I can tell you from experience that the sword is sharp and it hurts. You don't want to tell the people that you're going to lead their children in the next like 10 years of their life. You don't want to tell them that you've messed up. You want them to think, or at least I did at the time, I don't know, I've given up on that. But you want them to think that you know what you're doing at least. 
But there's a requirement of preparation of the bride, right? I love Jesus enough that I will go through this. But the sword hurts. But it's worth it. I think, I, think I'm, I think I'm coming to a close, so why don't we call the band up and I'm going to pray. I lived this morning's message through the, the prophetic and the worship. God is so faithful. And it ties into this beautifully, right? He will not leave you in your mess if you are willing to go through the process with him. Because the world wants to teach us over and over and over again. Like I said, it's in education systems now. It wants to teach us that these things are worship. There is a counterfeit out there. It talks about it in Revelation, the great harlot. There is a counterfeit lover out there that is trying to convince you to give her your attentions. And that looks like idolatry. It looks like impurity. It looks like all those different false teachings. But now is the time not to think, oh gosh, Jesus is good on a Sunday. It's time to think, oh my life, this is important. It's urgent. I'm going to go back to Revelation, was it 19? 197? There is an urgency to this message and I feel it in my spirit because the wedding day is coming. It's right around the corner. Every time you come into this building, every time another Sunday comes and goes, you are one week closer to the coming of Jesus. I'm not giving you a specific time. I'm just saying a, a fact. Every day you wake up and those mercies are new and you love Jesus and you go to your job and you do your stuff and you make mistakes. You're one step closer to the wedding day. One step closer to the wedding day. So why don't we stand? We're going to worship Jesus. And take a moment as you stand to just do one of those self-reflect moments. And just ask yourself, ask the Spirit, ask Jesus, can I honestly say I'm giving you everything I've got today? Can I honestly say that I have given you what I've got? That my attentions and affections are not split and this is an intimate thing. So if you put your hands out where you are, then we will know that you want to receive prayer and that you're ready to pray through that and our team will come and join you. If you're feeling brave, come to the front. We'll do that too. If you've got any other prayer need, come to the front. But I want to bless the room, Jesus, with that fresh revelation of Jesus as the jealous bridegroom lover who's standing with the double-edged sword of truth and he's screaming, I love you and I want your affections. I love you too much to leave you in the darkness. I love you too much to not highlight this to you. I want your heart 100%. That is the first commandment. All of your heart. What does that look like, God? What does that look like to love you with all of our hearts and to not withhold or hide or run away? So encounter us in this moment, Jesus. Come and convict where needs convicting, comfort where needs comforting and present yourself in a revelation of jealous lover, Lord. We're ready for it. We're ready to prepare ourselves as your bride.